Um, so I am going to use our time together today um, to talk more broadly about issues related to the transgender community, um, specifically also related to our campus, some of the things we can do to be an ally to our community members, um, and all of those kinds of things. Things. Oh, so first of all, I am Emily Mitchell. I am the new Pride Center coordinator, and this is why ARC should be very, very proud. Does anybody have any guesses how many staffed Pride Centers are in the entire nation at community colleges? So on a community college campus, staffed meaning somebody like me gets hired to sit somewhere and do things, right? Right? <laughs> things. I don't know what those things are. Um, in the entire nation. No, that would be worse. Yes. Five. And then we are one of the five in the nation, one of three in California. So there are three staffed pride centers in California, ourselves, Sierra, and a college in Walnut Grove, community college. And then nothing until like Minnesota. And then nothing again until the East, East Coast. So we should be very proud of the fact that we exist at all. So let's sort of jump in. And um, this is kind of an abbreviated version of the ally training I do on campus. This is a shameless plug, shameless plug. For one, I'm doing the ally training at the Flex event before convocation. Please come get your units if you need it, your hours. And if you want me to come to your department or your area, even if you don't want me to come to your area or department, I'm coming. Yes? OK. So let's define some terms and clear up some confusion, if any exists. So I tend to use this in my um, presentations. This is the gender bred person, OK? Um, and it's just a nice visual, right? So it helps us to understand some of these interacting things. So identity, how we feel. In, in this case, what we're talking about is gender. So our gender identity, our personal understanding of our gender, gender comes from our brain. Um, our attraction, right, is the heart. We all know because we're, you know, we know things. Who you love does not actually come from your heart. Just your blood does. It actually comes from your brain too, but it's cute with the hearts, like Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, sex, that's the genitals. And that's the chromosomes. These aren't actually what chromosomes look like. It's just a nice visual. Okay. So genitals and chromosomes. And then this, right, is your expression, how you show the world your gender identity, for example, OK? So let's talk about a couple different things. What is the difference between sex and gender? Who can tell me? This is a very interactive presentation. You guys are like, I didn't know I was going to have to talk. All right, so first of all, there's only like six of us. Tell me your name. Um, all right, Xavier, tell me the difference, as you understand it, between sex and gender. Ding, 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 right? So sex is the biological aspects. Again, genitals, chromosomes, right? They don't actually wave. Just go with it, OK? And gender is really the socially constructed ideas we have about what people with certain genitals and chromosomes are supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be behaving, and how they're supposed to be looking, right? Absolutely. By the way, we just make gender up, right? We just decide. Oh, we say this is for them, and this is for them. And there's very interesting, if you're ever interested in this, all the stereotypes we have associated with males, like pink is for girls and blue is for boys, used to be the opposite. right? High heels were originally developed for Persian soldiers. right? So there's a lot of these kinds of things. We just make them up. right? We can talk about why we make them up, but that's a different day. All right. So. You've probably heard this too. Even when we're talking about the biological aspects, we go, okay, there's male-bodied people and there's female-bodied people, and that's not actually true. There's a whole other group of people called intersex, which is an umbrella term, which means that there's either some mismatch between the chromosomes that are waving at you and the genitals, or that the genitals are ambiguous, making it unclear what the biological sex is. Now, just by a show of hands, this is not a judgment. This is not a place where you need to be like, I know everything, and I'm going to make you feel bad if you don't. That's not true. How many of you have ever heard the term intersex? Okay. How many of you have heard another term that's not intersex that you think might be the term intersex? First of all, tell me your name. Uh, my name's Molly. Molly? Yes. Okay. And I, it's, I've heard a different term, but it's still, I guess, a lot of 
Absolutely. It's okay. All of that is true. And I just want us to have an open and honest conversation so we're all on the same page. So the term you've probably heard, which is what I heard you say, Molly, is hermaphrodite. How many of you have ever heard the term hermaphrodite? Okay, not the current term, not the appropriate term, considered derogatory, okay? But I want us to be all on the same page. Just so in case anybody wants to know, hermaphrodite is a condition. It's when an individual has an ovary and a testis. That's actually what a hermaphrodite, that's the actual definition of a hermaphrodite, okay? Intersex is an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different conditions, right? Again, mismatch between the chromosomes and genitals or the genitals are ambiguous. Um, I ask my students this all the time. Do you think it's common or rare, intersex? Xavier? Uh, rare. Okay. Why do you think we think it's rare? Because it's actually not rare. So, for example, and nobody ever knows this. I'm not calling you out. No one ever knows this. Intersex conditions occur in every 1,500 to 2,000 life births. To put that into perspective, every time you interact with somebody who has naturally occurring red hair, this is just the frequency. This is not to indicate people with naturally occurring red hair are also intersex. Some are, some aren't, right? But people are like, oh, like, they're like, now I know. No. Okay. But as frequently as you interact with someone who has naturally occurring red hair is how frequently you have interacted with someone with some version of an intersex condition. That's pretty common. Why do we think it's so rare? Because we just don't talk about it, right? We just simply don't talk about it, and that's too bad, okay? All right, Teddy. So now we're going to talk about gender identity, and that's one's personal understanding of their gender. Okay. How many of you have ever heard the term cisgender? Okay. What does it mean? No one wants to talk to me. <laughs> Neha, what does it mean? I know. That's why I called on you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, perfect. So it's when the genitals, chromosomes match the identity, right? Everything's going in one like line, right? So this is what my chromosomes say, this is what my genitals say, and this is what I say about myself too, okay? Um, in contrast, and Janet Mock is an example, is transgender. Cis means same, trans means different, okay? So transgender means that the biological aspects, chromosomes and genitals, do not match the identity, that folks don't feel that those go hand in hand. We'll talk about some antiquated terms. We'll talk about some more current terms. So how many of you have ever heard MTF? Anybody ever heard that? Okay, it's an older term. MTF stands for male to female, male assigned at birth to female identity. T can sometimes stand for transition, male transition to female. Not the current term. What's the current term? Trans woman. Okay, How are, and then M or FTM, born female to male, female transition to male, current term trans man. Now, so for some folks, this gets really complicated, and people are like, I don't understand, like, I don't want to get it wrong, but I don't know what to do. Here's how you will never get it wrong, okay? Here you go. This is Laverne Cox. I could easily have put up a picture of Janet Mock, yes? Okay, so Laverne Cox, everything going this way, the expression, everything you see, what is that saying, gender-wise? What is the expression? Female, right? All female, all the time here, yes? Going this way. No one would ever look at Laverne Cox and describe anything she's putting out there as male, correct? So she is a trans woman, okay? This is Chaz Bono. Um, those of you old enough, some of us in this room, that's Cher's son. What? Everybody else is like, I don't know what you're saying. Um, <laughs> so who's Cher? What, what's that? Okay. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. Um, so again, what's all the expression outward? What's going out this way? What's the identity, the expression that's being put out there? Male, right? So Chaz Bono is a trans man. Okay. You'll never get it wrong if you go with the expression. Does that make sense? If you find yourself reverting and being like, well, I don't know, it's because you're focused on the genitals. Okay. 
And that's the, I, you should stop thinking about other people's genitals, I'm just saying. Okay, it's not your business. Okay, all right. Hey, Sarah. All right, so, you know, and now we're going to make it a little more complicated. Okay, so non-binary. If somebody is, says to you, I am gender non-binary, what does that mean? Can anybody help me to understand what that means? Well, let's break it down. Okay, because it's not really that complicated. What does binary mean? Two, right? On, off. Zero, one. Yeah? Okay? So in the case of gender, gender binary would be male, female. Yeah? So someone who identifies themselves as non-binary is saying what? These don't work for me. I don't feel like I'm male, and I don't feel like I'm female. I'm somewhere else on that continuum and spectrum. Does that make sense? Okay. I don't know. Some of you are like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening right now. Okay. Gender non-conforming. What's that? Neha. It, look, by the way, this isn't a test. Like, if you get it wrong, I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm very disappointed in you. Like, it's just a point of conversation, okay? So please don't feel like there's a huge, right? You're up next, Xavier, okay? Non-conforming. Right. So remember all that stuff we were talking about, gender, socially constructed, this is what males are supposed to be like, this is what females are supposed to be like. People who are gender non-conforming are like, yeah, that's not, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to look like that. I'm not going to act like that. That's just not, that's not how I roll. Okay, that's what gender nonconforming means. Gender fluid. Okay, we talked about non-binary, right? Uh, male doesn't work for me. Female doesn't work for me. What does the word fluid, Xavier, mean? When something's fluid, it moves. Okay, so applying that to the concept of gender identity, what do we think maybe gender fluid means? Right? So non-binary, I live somewhere in the middle, right? Somewhere other than at the two poles. Gender fluid, I move amongst these identities. Okay? Uh, gender queer, more like an umbrella statement, right? Sort of like my gender is queer. It's different. It, it's not, it doesn't fall in these two camps. Now it should be noted, so I usually say this more to the faculty and staff when I'm doing this training, is this is this is gender is changing a lot. People's conceptions of gender are changing a lot, especially for young people. In a study from the Williams Institute, which is housed out of UCLA, 27% of young Californians between the ages of 12 and 17 identify as gender nonconforming. Okay? They are our students. If they're not our students today, they will be our students tomorrow. And they have expectations about the way in which they expect to be treated on our campus. And in a world of falling enrollments, students will vote with their feet. And they will go somewhere else. So while I hope, of course, everything I say is super compelling from a humanistic side, if not, let's think about it logistically as well. We exist to serve our students. That is our job. It is our job to serve our students. So we need to know this information because we need to serve our students. All right, oh, it's a lot of words. Okay, so here are some of the realities that trans folks experience and face every day. Roughly 50% of trans folks have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. That number is highest, so the number ranges right around 45% to a little over 50%. Trans folks of color are more likely to be assaulted than white, trans folks, but roughly half of all trans folks have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. The murder rate for uh, American adults is 1 in 18,000, meaning 1 in every 18,000 Americans will be killed, murdered, right? That rate for transgender folks is 1 in 12, okay? And that rate is highest for trans women of color. 
School experiences, about a fifth or 20% of LGBTQ plus students experienced harassment in the past year. Um, I normally do this in the training and I didn't. What's with the plus? What's happening? Why, what's a plus now? How many of you were like, I don't, when did the plus creep in? Some of you, I know, were like, oh, where'd the plus come from? Anybody want to hazard a guess why we have a plus? So everybody would like their identities Acknowledged. That's a, that's a very human response. We all want that. So what was ending up happening is, right, you get the LGBTQAAIA. Do you know what I mean? So for efficiency and ease, we sometimes just add plus, meaning we take everybody. We're here to represent everybody. Okay. So again, about 20% of LGBTQ plus students experienced harassment in the past year on their campus. This was a college study, Rankin 2003 or 2010, I apologize, and that is on their college campus. About a half of them actually feared for their safety on their college campus, okay? Um, and the result is many, many students choose to conceal their identity, not acknowledging that they're members of the LGBTQ plus community for fear of discrimination and harassment, and most especially for fear of violence, okay? Housing. 23% of trans folks report housing discrimination, meaning you apply for that apartment and then you show up to look at the apartment and they suddenly tell you, um, never mind, right? 30% of trans youth are without stable housing or are homeless. It's a lot. What's happening? Why are these folks ending up homeless? Why are they housing unstable? Why are young people more than trans folks in general? Anyone? Anyone? Ed. Their families don't want to have anything to do with That's correct. So they come out to their families, and their families throw them out. So you're 15. You don't have a work permit. You don't have an address. Where are you going to end up? You're going to end up on the street. Okay? If we look at percentages in foster care, there's a very large percentage of foster care youth who are also LGBTQ plus identified. Nope. 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 I mean, you could technically, if they got into trouble, perhaps be prosecuted for not watching them. Your child might end up in child protective services, but they're going to become, quote, another runaway. And let me be very clear about how bad it is on the streets. First of all, if you are a young person and you are homeless, there are very few ways to make money. Yes, you don't have a work permit, you're not going to get a job at McDonald's, they're not hiring you, you're out of the house. What is one very reliable source of income? If you live on the street, sex work, okay? Many of these young people find themselves participating in what's called survival sex. This isn't willing entry into sex work. This isn't consenting behavior between adults. This is a very vulnerable population who must participate in sex work in order to have a place to sleep at night. Medical care, 23% of trans folks avoid seeking necessary care for fear of treatment, meaning for fear of how they will be treated, right, um, by their healthcare professionals. And 8% actually of trans folks report being denied emergency care because of their trans status. Okay. So the consequences to folks are huge, enormous. All right, so I want to spend our time together. We kind of know what the problem is. We kind of know that these things are not fair. We know all of those things, but sometimes we're just not sure what to do, how to say it, where to go, where to find information. So we're going to practice a little bit um, on how to be an ally to LGBTQ plus students. Um, so a classmate approaches you upset that a transgender woman is using the women's restroom in the building. She complains to you about being made uncomfortable by, quote, that man in the bathroom. Okay? What do you do? What do you say? What is ARC's policy on bathrooms? How, what, I don't, what do we do? So first, does anybody know ARC's policy on bathrooms? Okay. Well, then let me tell you. Every individual has the right to use the restroom that comports with their identity, 
PE facilities, sports teams, and bathrooms that are consistent with their identity. That is absolutely every person's right. Okay? Additionally, all single stall, all single stall rather, bathrooms on ARC campus are all gender bathrooms. How many of you have seen this little, like, it's a really nondescript, I mean, it's not super easy to understand, but the blue circle and the white triangle, how many of you have seen those? We don't have a ton of them, right? But if you see that, it means it's an all-gender bathroom. I want to be 100% clear. No person can be forced to use an all-gender bathroom. Do you know what I'm saying? So, for example, it would not be appropriate to say to that other student, well, there's a single stall bathroom, and that person should use that. No. Every person is free to use the restroom that is comfortable for them. If they would like a single stalled restroom, if they would like to use an all-gendered bathroom, then they can. Are all-gendered bathrooms only relevant, only important to members of the trans community? No. Or gender non-binary community or gender non-conforming community? No. I have a son, he's 10 years old, right? I'm a female, I'm a single mom. I'm not sending my 10 year old into the bathroom alone. Those all gender bathrooms, because I have received flack for taking him into the women's restroom, because he's 10. Isn't he too old to be in here? Well, I don't think so, but apparently other people do, right? If we have individuals with certain disabilities and they may have opposite sex helpers, if that individual needs help with trans, like, uh, Toileting, but also what a, transferring. I couldn't think of the word, right? This is also of an assistance to them. Nobody is required to use these bathrooms, but they are there as an assistance to everyone in addition to our trans and gender nonconforming community. Okay, so we know that now. We're good on that. But let's say a friend of yours walks up, Michael, and asks where to locate the all gender bathrooms. Do you guys know where the all gender bathrooms are? Do you know what you would say to a friend? Oh, I really want to help you, but I have no idea, right? Okay, I have something for you. So, if you go on the ARC Pride Center website, okay, why did that not work? You're touching things on my computer. There we go. And just so you know, if you do ARC Pride Center, we're the first thing that comes up on Google. Just saying. So here we are, okay? This is our website. This is all of these kinds of things. Um, and if you go under here for LGBTQ, you're asking yourself why plus isn't on there. You can't put a special symbol for the programming. Dumb. All right. If I go there, I can find a list of all the gender neutral bathrooms. They're all keyed. Sarah and I both worked on this with the members of Fierce. Friday at 11 o'clock, Sean and I and some actors will be going around making a video series so that we can also post a video so students can see what it kind of looks like in real time and how to find everything and all of those kinds of things. So, yeah, we'll send it out broadly, but you know, it's, so you, everybody will be able to find them, okay? All right. And there's just another example of it. Okay. A student arrives in your class. Their name is Alex, and their gender expression is ambiguous. Short hair, masculine clothing, long painted fingernails, and makeup. You notice that the other students use the pronoun she for Alex. You also notice that Alex winces each time and looks very uncomfortable. How do you help? What do you do? What's this an issue of? Sarah? Well, I think you asked Alex what her pronoun, the first pronoun is her. Okay. So are you talking about like from the perspective of the student? Yeah, so either way, right? So like as we think about being an ally and we might find ourselves in this situation, one way of diffusing this is to simply step up and say, Hi Alex, I'm Sarah. I use they them pronouns. What pronouns do you use? which then gives Alex the opportunity to say what Alex uses for pronouns. 
Okay? Now, some people are like, I, I don't even know what we're talking about here, and that would feel very uncomfortable to me. Like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. There's a couple things. One, using someone's name is rarely going to go wrong. Alex, where would you like to? Alex went to the store. Alex left. Now I get it. You're going to say Alex 50 times. It might be a little difficult, right? What's kind of another pronoun you could use where, you know, you're kind of covering everybody? They, right? I know, I know, Kathy. You're an English professor, right? All right, do, do, right? I know. I was like, where's my grammarians in the room, right? Lay is not, you know, right? Right, exactly. But language changes all the time in the ways in which we use information, and language changes all the time. They encompasses everyone, right? A couple ways that you can do it as a faculty member. This just happens to be my dean for the Pride Center, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I have it as well at the end. Of, and Sarah, you do as well, yes? Your pronouns on your email signature? <laughs> you bad. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> the only person I'm going to shame is Sarah. No, I'm kidding. Um, you can just indicate it on your signature line. For faculty, this is really important because it tells any student who's non-conforming or trans, if they look at that on your thing, they know you understand. Does that make sense? It's almost like, like an insider, right? You're like, yeah, I know, I know, she, her. Mm. They're immediately going to feel more comfortable, OK? Um, you can send out things at the beginning, you know, just sort of saying, like, these are my pronouns. You can start class that way. You can go around in a circle and ask, and those all kind of indicate that. Um, it is one of the most basic ways of showing that you respect their identity. And you have to understand that people have had long histories. Long, we just saw lots of violence, lots of discrimination. They come to you as a classmate or as a student, and they have had a long history potentially of not being treated very well. Right? A simple act of human kindness in saying, what pronouns do you use goes a long way for folks who have been mistreated for a long time. Right? All right. So inevitably, this comes up. But what if I make a mistake? What if I get it wrong? First and foremost, you will make a mistake, and sometimes you will get it wrong. We're human beings. We make mistakes. So what do you do? Correct yourself quickly and move on. Don't make that person make you feel better for the mistake. Does that make sense? So for example, let's say I incorrectly use the pronoun she for someone. I know that that person's pronouns are he. For whatever reason, I made a mistake and said she. Just what she, I mean he, and move on. Not, oh god, <sighs> I'm really trying. This is also very complicated for me. You know, I didn't mean it, right? Is that really what somebody wants to have happen? They just want you to fix it and move on. Now, be clear. If you've hurt someone, and you know when you have, privately, later, go to them and say, I am really sorry. I hurt you. I know I hurt you. I am really trying, and I'm sorry, right? And then try better in the future. And that's really what you can do. All right, so you have a transgender friend who is enrolled in an online class. Their legal name is Michael, but they have chosen the name Rose as they identify as a woman. Your friend is very upset and is considered dropping the class because they're constantly referred to as Michael and with male pronouns. So is there a way on campus at ARC to indicate, I'm going to use the terminology we use here at ARC, and then I'm going to give you the more correct term we're working on it a preferred name, more appropriately chosen or lived name. Is there a way to do that here at ARC? There is. There is. Would I really have asked if there was? Okay, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> like, I'm not dumb. I'm going to set myself up. Okay, so this is so super hard to read, so I'm just going to show you my PeopleSoft. Do not come visit me, okay, because my address is going to be up there. Like, do not show up at my house like, hey. Okay, we're not friends. OK, um, so here is my PeopleSoft. Of course, it's going to be like you have to sign back in. And this is not intuitive. And then I want to give you the caveats, OK? So this is really me. 
I really am signed up for a workout class. Don't judge me, okay? Um, so I go down here to contact information, and I'm going to go to mailing address. You know, the address you're not coming to. Okay, good. When I'm at addresses here, there's a couple tabs across the top, right? Addresses, names, and phone numbers. If I go to names, now, I want to be clear, I indicated or included a preferred name so I could go check myself in at all the departments and make sure it worked. All I did was change the spelling of my name, right? But if you had a name that you choose that is not your legal name, you would simply press edit, indicate whatever name that is, and save. One of the first major things I did as Pride Center coordinator is work with the programmer so everything that uses SARS data, meaning financial aid, counseling, will show your preferred name. Okay, again, terminology is, is clunky. Preferred is not the most appropriate. On my list of attack items, it's on there. It's just, you know, a lot, right? Le additionally, you, okay, so this just came up the other day. Let's talk about um, our overall unified Canvas Drive business. You know what I'm talking about, right? How we all get on there. First of all, you indicate a preferred name will be on every single roster. Do want to be honest with you. What's going to happen? Preferred name occurs in parentheses in red. If you're looking at it electronically, it'll be black and white when you print it. Your teacher will see your legal name. If you have a preferred name, your teacher is going to see your legal name. They do know they're supposed to use your preferred name. Okay, Canvas, going to show your preferred name. Um, Gmail, a couple more steps, right? I can totally show you how to do that. Sean and I are working on a like screenshot thing so that it'll show you. I've got some screenshots that are a little clunky, right? But I can show you how to do that so that when you send out an email through the unified Gmail, it uses your preferred name and doesn't default to your legal name. Here's where we haven't been successful. I have a meeting with the vice chancellor next week. When you use the drive, yeah, it has your W, W, da, 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 da. That name, which will be your legal name, you can't change at this point. We understand that at assessment, this is an issue. You show up, you've got to show some legal documentation of whatever that is. You get a student ID. We cannot at this point create a student ID with the preferred or chosen name. We're, we're not there yet. I am working on it. I'm aware of the problem. All the UCs do it. So if they can do it, we should be able to do it. Okay? Hey, by the way, we're ahead of Sac State on the chosen name thing. Totally ahead of them. They don't do any of that. We do a lot of it, just saying. Um, so you can change your name that way. I, you know, again, I want you to be aware of the places where that's going to work and where that's not, but you're not going to show up to counseling anymore and have your dead name called out in front of everybody. You're not going to show up to financial aid and your dead name's up on the screen, right? It is going to be your chosen or list name that's up there as long as you've indicated one. Okay. Uh, Oh, we did that, sorry. Okay, a student comes to you distraught. He tells you that his professor refuses to use the student's chosen name, Damon, which they indicated on e-services, we just talked about that, and instead insists on using their legal name, Jennifer. This outs the student as transgender to all other students in the class. The student has discussed their concerns with the professor who essentially says this trans stuff is ridiculous and under academic freedom, I can say what I want in class. The student wants to quit school and is deeply pained by this experience. So first, is the professor right? I mean, not even like from a moral standpoint, <laughs> which we would all agree no, but from the university policies on anti-discrimination and harassment, are they right? They are not, okay? This is our non-discrimination and harassment policy. I put in blue the parts that are important to us. The district and Los Rios employees agree not to discriminate against or harass any employee, student, or prospective student on the basis of gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, or sexual identity. They are not right. That is not true. That is not permissible, 
and it is not okay. So again, and this is probably less relevant to some of the members that I'm talking to today, but in some of the other trainings that I do, it sometimes comes up. You may feel any way you wish. I can't control that. I may wish you felt differently, but I can't make you. But this is your job. And this is the contract that we all signed up for. So you don't have to like it, but you got to do it. Well, what if somebody doesn't do it? I don't, who do I go to? Who do I talk to? Who do I bring this up to? Me. Okay. So I am uh, under AB 620, which called for a number of different things. But one of the things it called for was that each campus must have a point of contact for the needs of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. And that's me. Okay. I am the AB 620 officer here on campus. You come talk to me. I will take your initial complaint. We will route it to the appropriate person. And then at that point, I stop being the collector of facts and I start being the advocate on your side. I will go to those meetings with you. I will sit with you. I will advocate for you. My first job is to take the complaint. My second job though, and I was very clear that I wanted there to be a line between this, is that I am an advocate for you. I am here for you, whether you are a student, faculty or staff. You cannot, if I am a, a professor and my students are harassing me, I am here for you. That cannot happen. I mean, it can happen. It's not, well, you know, you know what I'm saying. Okay. All right. So the Pride Center is here to help you. That's what I'm here for. That's what I get paid for. If you're unsure what to do, you find yourself in a situation you don't know what to do, call me. Email me, come by the Pride Center. We should have a full time, so I am 50% release time for the Pride Center. We are, like today, having another meeting and interview soon. By the end of the semester, we will have a full time person at the front desk, eight to five, Monday through Friday. Because I'm not in the office eight to five, Monday through Friday. There will be someone there, okay? Uh, send your students to the Pride Center. If you're faculty, if you're staff, and you have a student who's struggling, send them to me. Ask for additional training for your department. You know, this actually has come up a number of times. People will say, hey, I interacted with this particular group of folks. Seems like maybe they could use some assistance around these ideas, right? It's fine, come talk to me. And we are here as a resource to all students, faculty, and staff. All right, so I wanna open it up for some questions. If you guys have any questions, and then I have some papers to give you and all those kinds of things. So does anybody have any questions, either about the topics that we've talked about, things that you've seen? Oh boy. Sarah. Well, Just kidding. I should know this. Um, Uh-oh. Is the, uh, you are um, employed at the college or the district. Is your health plan currently approved? Oh Jesus, I should know this too. Okay. And that, so here's the thing. Here's my gut reaction to that. Uh, there's not one health plan. Yeah, so so I if yeah. do you pick, and I haven't done this work, I should or maybe I should get the health center to do it, uh, Kaiser Health Net, do you know what I'm saying? And then go through. That's a very worthwhile thing to do and would be helpful and informational, I think, to faculty and stu I mean, students don't get our health benefits, but it's a good question and I don't know the answer and I'm sorry. I know everything else. No, I'm kidding, <laughs> I don't. Any other questions? Was every, did you know all of that before I started talking? Was there anything new you learned today? Yes. Some of you are like, I'm not talking to you. That's all right. Uh, yes? I just have a comment. So when people um, say that they have a problem today and then come after them and it's not proper English, yeah. I always give the example that if, say if someone were running by and you couldn't, you couldn't see their, their gender, you would refer to them. They yeah. Oh, we do it all the time, yeah, actually. Yeah. Oh, for that matter, how many times did you like, I was at the DMV and the clerk, they were so mean. Yeah, yeah. That's they, it was one person, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So I like to say when we talk about bathroom debate, it isn't about bathrooms and it wasn't about buses, right? So a lot of times when people have these issues around like I don't wanna use that pronoun or that pronoun, they gotta kinda ask themselves, why is this such a big deal? Why is this so hard for you? Why, why is this cause, why, why are, is the hill you're willing to die on the fact that they, it's plural, yeah. right? That, that was, you know, that's, so 
I appreciate that, you know, like, hey, here's the counterpoint. Uh, I agree. I mean, look, I was just listening to NPR on the like Webster's Dictionary, and the woman said that she introduced the term bodice ripper. Okay, that's like a term about like uh, romance novels. They're bodice rippers, right? I was like, really? That's cute, right? But that's an evolution of, it doesn't actually technically mean someone walked up and ripped a bodice. Right, but it is descriptive language of a type of romantic genre literature, right, that indicates a certain thing. Ed. All this afternoon, I've, I've had this memory, this flashback. Sitting in this room, probably more than 10 years ago, at a college hour, where a transgender student mm -hmm. had the courage to mm -hmm. speak about her experience. Um, and this room was filled with hostile people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it is a, I have been teaching here on campus for six years. Every year I would bring folks in. Normally I bring uh, Rachel Hudson in from the Gender Health Center. And over time, just to see how much more welcoming, affirming, and receptive people are than even when I started six years ago. The, the tide, it's changing, and it's all for the better, right? You know, what is the, the arc of history is slow, but it bends towards justice, you know, or whatever equality, I can't remember all the words, but you know, it's that sort of idea that it like, right, let's not bother with words, um, <laughs> that, that it does take time, um, but it's really important. So I do want to let you guys know about a couple upcoming events for the Pride Center. So we are having our Lavender graduation. So anybody who's a graduate is going to be graduating. Um, we would love for you guys to participate. We have a lot of faculty who are also wanting to participate, and that's fantastic. So I'll hand those out. And if you know anybody who is doing really good work for the LGBTQ plus community, nominate them. We want to give them an award at Lavender Graduation, both for students, and for faculty, staff, administrators who are doing good work around this. We want this to be an important thing. And remember, we are really rather groundbreaking here at ARC, and we should be very proud. We've had a checkered past around these issues. And I'm glad to see that we are, um, you know, paying that back. All right, so I'm gonna hand these out to you guys. I, sure. Yeah, well, because I think that Janet Mock's experiences, though obviously are her own and are unique, right, are really indicative. She, you know, experienced a lot of discrimination in her own family. Um, with new romantic partners. Um, all of those kinds of things are very reflective of the same experiences that the trans community in general, though hers is a specific experience, more globally in those kinds of ways. She's also someone with some privilege, right? Our students often have less of those privileges and more of those struggles. And, you know, we see folks with not a huge safety network, right? And I think we need to be incredibly mindful that this is not just work only for the LGBTQ plus community, but in social justice in general, right? Um, this is the work that we need to be doing. I don't think I did what you want to do. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming. I hope you found it informative. I'm going to walk around and get my exercise.